Welcome back to the Supreme Leadership Series. I hope you had a great summer. Leadership is about influence, nothing more and nothing less. John Maxwell, arguably the voice of our generation on the topic of leadership, he penned this transcendent truth about leadership. Once again, leadership is about influence, nothing more and nothing less. I totally agree. Leadership's about influence, but in my view, leadership comes with the responsibility to use that influence to help everyone in your life become the best version of themselves. At home, in the workplace, everywhere, with everyone. Leaders either leverage their influence to help others become their best, or they don't. Unfortunately, leaders sometimes, oftentimes, influence others to become less than their best. We all experience the consequences of that reality every day in our lives. We live in complex times. COVID, monkeypox, Russia, racial tensions, the economy, division, remote working, and social media. These challenges are challenging leaders, you and me, like never before. Bearing all that in mind, Supreme Lending decided to launch this Supreme Leadership Series with an interest to inspire you as a leader, to educate you as a leader, and to serve you as a leader. Why? So that your leadership, your influence, would lead others to the destination that everyone really wants to get to in life. That destination? Best. We started the year with John Maxwell unpacking what the best leaders do and what they don't do. We then spent time with Dr. Ike Reichard and Mike Ray to discuss how to build, select the players to build the best teams. We continued with Horst Schulze, the co-founder of the Ritz-Carlton to discuss delivering remarkable, the industry's best customer experience. We then spent more time with John Maxwell in May to focus on building unbeatable cultures. Then we took a break this summer to give us all room to invest in the relationships that matter most at home with our families. Today, the Supreme Leadership Series continues with John Maxwell unpacking practical ways to elevate your leadership and mine to the next level. Since we last met together, well, things have gotten just a bit more challenging in our industry. Inflation, rising interest rates, continued low inventory, and most of all, uncertainty about what's next. In seasons of adversity, leadership matters more than ever. The stakes are higher, and every member of your team and my team is looking to you for clarity, for the roadmap to get to best. Today, we'll strengthen our leadership skills to do just that, to lead all in our lives to best. This is the Supreme Leadership Series. John, welcome back to the Supreme Leadership Series. Great to be with you, Pat. Thanks for having me. I, I noticed in your introduction that you've had all those other guys one time. This is my third time. I, I, I'm only assuming that you're just going to let me keep coming back to get it right. That's all I can figure out. You? <laughs> no, John, it's like I said before we got on the program. You're the headliner of the band. You're the Beatles. You're the Rolling Stones. <laughs> And for those that were not on before, Ed, John said, no, I'm just older than them. I said, I don't think so. I think Horst may have the edge there. Yeah, yeah. Horst, <laughs> anyway. I, I love Horst, but he is a little bit older than me. But, but yeah, I, I, Pat, just let me just say what, what you're doing with your Supreme Leadership Series is outstanding. First of all, you're a terrific leader yourself, and you're a friend of leaders. You have always loved leadership, and you've always loved leaders. And for what you do for all of us, Thank you very, very much. It's it's always a joy, always a joy to be with you. That's a fact. Well, well we're thanking you uh, for being back with us again today. I hope you've had uh, so far the best summer ever. You just told me you were traveling around the world and meeting with uh, dignitaries and countries and, and doing small group and changing lives all over um, the planet, which um, since I've known you going back to the late 90s, um, it doesn't surprise me, none of it. And earlier, um, you know, you said in a very simple way, you said, hey, look, I just want to help others. 
And I think sometimes we make leadership, we make life more complicated than it needs to be. And when you said that, I just caught it because most people are trying to help themselves. And when I meet with people like yourself that have climbed the mountain, have kept the mountain, they generally have what in common, which is they're always out doing things for other people. <laughs> let's, well, let's go to work, my friend. <laughs> you know what, Pat? Uh, you're so right. Let me just say this. Um, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And when especially youth come to me and they want me to pack leadership in for them, I, I very simply say to them, you probably don't have the title, you probably don't have the, you don't have the experience, you don't have the position. You don't even have the influence in the beginning, but if you'll serve others and add value to others, you will gain all the influence you want. So when people say, well, how do I get influence? I, I don't say strive for leadership. I really say strive for servanthood. And if you serve people well uh, and do it for the right reason, you will have all of the leadership opportunities you ever want in your life. So it's not really about getting to the front of the line. But by the way, if you're really good and you're back in the back somewhere serving people, the people at the front will notice and, and they'll pull you up to the front of the line. It, yeah, I mean, you, 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 you can either go to the front of the line or you can grow to the front of the line. And, and it, what's really beautiful is when you serve others, you grow. You just you grow in your influence and you grow to the front of the line. So anyway. Yeah, the, problem, the problem is um, it's, so, it's so natural to serve yourself that you have to be intentional about what you just described. And it's not all that complicated. You just have to change your focus and make it about everyone else. Look, we do that with our spouses and significant others if we ever get it right, with our children if we ever get it right. And it's really no different uh, in the workplace. They just happen to be somebody else's spouses and somebody else's uh, children. So, John, we all do, and staying on this theme, we all want, like if you ask any single leader that's here today, um, do you want to be your best? The answer is yes. And do you want to maximize your success as a leader? The answer is yes. How does John Maxwell define success for his life and his leadership? It's a great question. And so I really, I'm glad you asked that. Um, I've been, I've been in the last four or five months, I've been speaking to a lot of leaders on a subject that I just developed. I've never read anything about this at all, never, um, called success stabilizers. And, and, and the thesis of the success stabilizer talk that I do is the fact that success throws you off. Uh, how many times have you seen people, they just lose their way. I mean, for, for a whole bunch of what reasons. And, and so how do we stabilize our success? How do, how do we develop a core? How do we develop a foundation, an anchor, a North Star, so that when we're successful, we don't screw up? And, and when, I was, when I was in my late 30s, Pat, I, uh, I just saw, I, first of all, my books were starting to sell. I, I was still a pastor. I had the 10th largest church in America. And, and I, I saw a lot of successful people not do really well, lose their families, you know, just, just not do well. And so it probably has about 38. And, and I, so I said to myself, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to develop a personal definition of success. Not your definition for me, not anyone's definition for me. I'm, I'm going to have to figure out for me. What is success for me? Because success, as you know, it's it's very subjective. If we if we took your whole audience and asked them what success was, we'd have dozens of different answers. And and it's not right or wrong at all. It's subjective. But what I what I realized was I had better figure out for me what success is, so that I can stabilize myself. And so it took me about, about six months, um, but I came up with a good definition of success for me for me. And it's had stabilized me, and I've, you know, my gosh, I've for almost forty years now. It's it's been kind of my, um, it's been my my inner core as far as a leader. So for me, success is having those who know me the best, love and respect me the most. That's what success is, and and it's very simple. It's not complicated. It means that people. You know, my family, you know, my inner, the people I work with, the, the people that know me the best, they love and respect me the most. And, and when you think about it, Pat, you know, something's wrong with me 
if those who don't know me well like me better than those who do know me well, there's there's something there's something off. So that was very helpful to me. And, and so once I once I said that that's going to be success to me, it wasn't dependent upon what people who didn't know me said. It wasn't dependent upon outward stuff. It was just really dependent upon having a relationship that was solid with people who knew all my all my weaknesses. I mean, that these people that are I'm talking about, <laughs> I have some downside. I'm human. And, and yet they still love and respect me the very most. And, uh, you know, Margaret and I have been married for 53 years. I have, you know, Melinda Eggers, my assistant, has been with me for 34 years. I have many staff that have been with me for 25 years. And, and, and we've just grown together. And they know me. They know my strengths and my weaknesses. But, but we love each other. and We work together. So I, for me, that has kind of been my um, stabilizer for success. So that's what I think personally is success. Then here's what I tell people. Once you get a personal definition of success for you, then get a, six, a definition of success for life. What, what, now, what, 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 do I, what do I want to do to you know, make a difference? And, 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 and so therefore, then I, then I put together uh, success for me, which, was, is, which is three things. Uh, knowing my purpose in life. I, I, I think, to me, success outwardly has to start there because we're all created for a purpose and we have, we have giftedness for a purpose. And, and so it, it's, it's kind of like, well, I mean, what's it going to help me if I climb the success ladder only to get to the top and find out it's leaning against the wrong building? And, and, and I see that. You know what I mean? I, see I people, do. I see people do that all the time. So, I think it starts with me, me, you know, really discovering my purpose in life. And I think that you, you do that through two things, passion and giftedness. But then secondly, it goes beyond that. It's, it's not only discovering my purpose in life, but, but then sowing uh, uh, seeds that benefit others. So I, I don't live just for myself. And, and, and then also developing and growing myself. Once, once I found my purpose, now I've got to reach my potential. You know, your purpose is what you should be doing. Your potential is how well you're going to do it. And, and, then, and then pour it into other people and serve others. And so anyway, that's, that's success to me. And it, it works. And, and I just hope everybody, all the, all the people that are in your program, I just hope that they just kind of do that for themselves. It'll stabilize them in a very unstable world. I, I know that. Well, listen, that's um, a tremendous amount of wisdom, and I've just gotten to question one. That was unbelievable, because in the world of business, you know, people talk about production and about the number of units that one has produced and sold, and they get awards for it. We recognize people, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things, but as we sit here today trying to sharpen each other, iron sharpening iron, about leadership and the topic of leader leadership, it's so easy for all of those things to come out of your mouth. I think all of us would do well to make sure that we create a very specific definition as you have yeah. for what is success for yeah. our lives as leaders. And then to the extent that um, we have specific ways to play that out every day, I think to the extent that we do that, we're going to wind up doing much better as leaders. John, today's world, you know, arguably – we live in some of the most complex times ever. You know, COVID was unprecedented because it changed, well, all of our lives for a couple of years, certainly not just at home, but in the workplace. There's the political and racial divide that is constantly in the news, if you will, and the economy, of course, has gotten in the news a lot more recently for different reasons than it did a couple of years ago. And there's social media in the background that's essentially fueling the conversation of division, right? Um, so yeah. that we live in a more divided. And by the way, all the people that are here today leading, all of the people that they're responsible for, bring that to work if they're allowed to go back to work or if they're at work uh, because they, they, they weren't working for a long period of time. But all of that energy is coming into the workplace. What advice would you give all of us as leaders to keep from feeling the burden um, that is a result of the complexity that we live in today. 
That is a great question, Pat. It, it's a great question. It's not an easy one to answer, but it has to be answered because we're all feeling this. This is this is not something that someone else is having, but I'm not having, or someone else is experiencing, but you know, kind of skipped me. Uh, first of all, COVID affected everybody. It, COVID moved every person, whether they wanted to move or not, didn't really matter. It moved all of us. So what you're talking about is just absolutely huge. First of all, let me just say, because you, you, you referenced the question with burden of leadership. Um, first of all, I would say to all the leaders today is you, you should feel the burden. Okay, let's start there. You should feel the burden. If you don't feel the weight of leadership during this time, you're not a conscientious leader. You're not a leader that cares for people. You, yeah, so I feel the burden there. And, I, and to me, it doesn't lift or doesn't go away. So I'm not really trying to remove the burden. What I'm trying to do, Pat, is give the burden purpose. I'm trying to get meaning out of the burden so that it gives a, a sense of um, security to the people. So, so let's talk about this just, just, just for a moment. First of all, leadership is visual. Okay, so the time the people need to see the leader the most is when the times are difficult. That, that's when they need to see them the most. Now, that's gotten a little difficult because of virtual and COVID. And so it, it, it's kind of like the people need me the most. And then I got removed from them and they got removed from me. And, and so we had to go virtual. But but. The most important thing a leader has to understand is that the people have to see you during tough times. Um, and let me class the example, Winston Churchill. Uh, when, when Winston, during the bombings of, of London, when, when he was taking a stand against Nazism, you know, Pat, dur during the bombings and, you know, every, mo every morning, what would Winston Churchill do? He, he'd get out of his bunker. He'd go right to the side of the bombings, wherever it was, smoking his cigar, walking among the ruins, and, and they're taking pictures of it. Pictures, pictures, pictures. They weren't taking pictures of him in, in, a, in a safe place. They were taking pictures of him in ruins. And, and what he was basically doing is he was saying to the people, I understand what we're going through. I see it. It's, it's all around me. I'm, I'm walking over ruins right now. So the, the people get security out of the leader saying, I, I, I see this, I feel this, I'm experiencing this with you. And then he was sending a visual message to them, Pat, of, let me tell you something. We got hit last night, but we are not going to stop. We are going to continue our course. We are not going to allow someone else to determine our future. And so he has this visual presence of, I know what we're going through, and it's we, not you. But it's also, I want you to know, I'm still walking, I'm still moving, and, and I'm still giving you the victory sign, and, and, and I'm still telling you that we're going to persevere and, and, and that we're going to be victorious. And I think it's a classic example of what people need at, at, at this stage, and it, that is that they need leaders. Now, we don't deny reality. So we, like during COVID, people would say, well, I'm, I'm uncertain about the future as far as I don't know what's going to happen. And I look at him and said, neither do I. I. I don't know what's going to happen. I, well, I mean, really? I know what's going to happen. We didn't even know COVID was going to hit. I got surprised by that. So, you know, so, so you, you, there's, a, there's an honesty, an authenticity, a vulnerability, a realistic uh, perspective that the people need to hear from the leader. But then I would say, I, I really don't know. I, I, but, but here's what I know. I can, I can handle today with you. Let, let's do today. Let's can we do today? And and, and you know, here's what I, if we do today well, we set up tomorrow well. And so we're just we're 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 not focusing on what's going to happen three months out. We're gonna we're gonna focus on what can I do today? And I think what happens. <coughs> I'm sorry, I've been traveling. No I got out. All. I got a junk, I got some junk in me. But but here's here here, here I think this Pat is 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 the big miss. People do not want leaders to be Mr. or Ms. Answer Man. They're, what they're really wanting me to do is to, is to walk with them. 
you know, I, I have, a, I have a, a lesson called the leadership dance. The leadership dance basically is that when you're a leader, you, there are different dances. There are times you dance before the people. There are times you dance behind the people. There are times that you dance above the people. But there are times you dance with the people. With the people. Yeah. And, and, and during this time, what we're talking about now, you dance with the people. You, you stay close. You, you walk with them and say, I, I got it. I feel it. I, we're doing it together. And there's a there, there's a security in um, proximity that's just very important for leadership at, at, at this time. I agree. You know, we had um, grills gone wild here at the office, not girls. I want to make sure that everybody's clear on that. It was grills gone wild here at the office about two or three weeks ago. And um, and we had a large group of people that have not been coming in on the regular come in. And um, it was like a celebration in the middle of a challenging market, but you could feel the energy. And I could almost feel people wanting me to say something, you know, like, tell us, put this in context for us, whether it's the industry or what's going on in and around the world. So uh, my son, John, I think you'll like this. Um, my son, Kenzie, is 32. Of course, I've been knowing him for a bit, as they say in the South. But a couple months ago, he said, Pops, heavy is the crown. Yeah. Right. So if folks are feeling a bit of burden because they're in leadership, to your point, they should, because we're responsible to affect other people's lives. Um, it does come with, with their responsibility. And I, I guess that can feel heavy at times. Yes. But um, let me just add one, one, pack, one quick thing on the responsibility, because we all feel that it's also our greatest hour. Let, let's, let's not miss this. Uh, the greatest hour of a leader is never during good times. You cannot show me any place in history where great leaders excelled and were greatly acclaimed during good times. Absolutely. You, 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 mentioned, you, you mentioned Winston Churchill. Absent the crisis, he would not be who we talk yeah, about 75 not, years later. Um, yeah. And the same thing for Zelensky in, in Ukraine today, right? No one would ever pray that that be the circumstance, but you know, he's writing a story about leadership that's pretty magnificent. John, yeah. 25 years ago, you yes. and I were both, we were both a bit younger. And <laughs> <laughs> it was at that time that you wrote the 21 Laws of Leadership. And for uh, our audience today, you need to know wow. that John has, uh, he's just re-released the 21 Laws, which was um, his best-selling book and and really has been read by by more people probably than any other leadership book, maybe other than the Bible um, on the planet. Um, I picked the number of the laws because I want our viewers to leave today, the leaders in the audience to leave today with the focus on working on three or four things. Like these are the three or four things I'm going to do better tomorrow, be intentional tomorrow about sure. these things. We've already talked about defining success, uh, but now we're going to talk about a few of your laws, which are they're uh, they're famous uh, because. <clears throat> so let's start with the law of connection. Tell us about the law of connection and how you think about leadership and owning responsibility for the law of connection. Well, I love it. The law of connection says leaders touch a heart before they ask for a hand, and so this is all about before you ask people to give you something or do something for you. Have have you connected with them? And, uh, you know, leaders, here's the myth. You never start leading people. I never hear anybody talk about this, but it's so true. You have to find them, and then you lead them. You, 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 have, to, you have to find them by knowing that what their passion is, what their motivations are. You know, you, you find them, and then you lead them, which means leaders are activists in going first to where the people are. Leaders don't say, find me, come to me, I'm the leader. We, 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 we go to them. And why do we go to them? We go to them to find the key. Linda Kaplan Thaler uh, is, is huge in the marketing world, and she's a wonderful friend. She's the one, the best thing, uh, this will simply just tell you all you need to know. She put the duck in Aflac. Okay, so there you go. Uh, yeah, quack, quack. Here we go. That, every time you hear quack, quack, that's Linda Kaplan. I need one of those ducks. I need, I need her to help me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, well, you know, they hired her. Because Affleck was just nobody could even, they didn't even know what it was. And, and so anyway, it all started with the duck. But anyway, she was, uh, we were talking one day having lunch and 
she was going to she was going to have an interview or tell me she was going to have an interview with um, Warren Buffett. And, and, but they said that she could only have 10 minutes and, and she really wanted about 45. So she talked, this is connection. She studied up on Warren Buffett and found out that his favorite drink is a cherry Coke. So the day that she finally got her 10 minute audience with Warren Buffett, she walked in with a can of cherry Coke and a glass full of ice and sat down across from me, opened the cherry coke poured it said mr buffett i understand your favorite drink is cherry coke i just thought i would bring you one to kind of get us started off uh, on a good foot and he smiled real big at her i mean she hadn't even started the interview he started real big at her and he said young lady he said anybody that will bring me a cherry coke can have as much time as they want oh and, my and that 10 minute yeah the 10 minute interview became an hour interview and, and, and it wasn't because she was a great interviewer it was because she understood how to connect with him. And, and so all of our leaders, you just have to understand, you got it, you got to find the key. And, and so you, you, the, goal of, the goal for you as a leader is not to get the people to connect with you. The goal for you is to connect with people. It, it's, you initiate that, you find them and then lead them. And, and then it works. Yeah, you know, I made some notes um, when I asked the question be, um, before getting prepared for it. And I wrote down, meet them where they are. And that's exactly what you're saying. And we can only, um, you know, oftentimes I think as leaders go, we want them to be someplace else and to be someone else, but they're not someplace else and they're not someone else. And really the hallmark, as I think about it, of course, lots of this is learned um, through going to the John Maxwell Leadership School is, is that if leaders don't move people to a better place on the regular, then they're really not doing the job that leaders are assigned to do. So great advice. Everyone should leave here today. And really the folks that they that they struggle most with, maybe sit down with them and ask them about their life story because there may be things in there or there may be things about their current story in life that are limiting them to some extent. And having somebody to talk to like a leader who genuinely cares, that's what the law of connection is all about. All right, let's go on to another law. Let's talk about the law of addition. Well, that's the law of serving, really, although I knew in the business world, I could use it called the law of serving. So I called it the law of addition, put something plus in it. And, and, but the sub of the, the, the description of the law of, of addition is that leaders add value to others, because that's exactly what, what, what we do. We talked a little bit earlier, Pat, about when I work with young people, I tell them that what they need to do is add value to people. They begin to increase their influence. And that's that's step one. When you, when you, this is important. We have to do three things. When, when, when we, we have to value people. It, it starts there. And, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we really have to value people. If you don't value people, you'll always misuse them and manipulate them. That, that's, that's just a fact. So you have to value people. But if you really want to um, increase this adding value to people, you have to make yourself more valuable too. So I tell people all the time, if you're not growing and learning and developing and, 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 and increasing your skills, uh, there's going to be a day that you can't add value to anybody because you, you, it's the same thing you've always done. And you, you so you have to keep growing yourself. So if I want to, if I want to add value to people, I have to value people, and then I have to develop and grow myself in adding value to people. But then thirdly, I have to know what they value. And this goes back to our previous conversation. You have to, you know, I, I, when I sit down with a group of leaders, a lot of times I ask them, okay, take your top three people. Can you tell me uh, what they're passionate about? Can you, can you tell, them, tell me what their top two out of seven motivations? Can you tell me what the top two motivations are? Can you tell me what their temperament is? Then I just ask about a dozen questions, all about knowing the person that's on your team. And it's, it's almost pat astounding. Very few times can a leader just talk to me and say, yeah, I, I got this and I understand this. And again, we have to really spend a lot of time, you know, knowing the people so that we can lead them, we, we can lead them with integrity, and and leaders. That, that that's my responsibility. My my responsibility is to know you well enough, Pat, and spend time with you and ask 
question. Jerry and I wrote a book a few years ago called Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. And, and that, that book, it took off. I was very surprised, really. <clears throat> but it was such a new thought <clears throat> that took off. But but it's all about it's all about finding people and adding value to them. John, we 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 in large part I wanted to put this program on because we see examples every single day in our lives of leadership not done best. And I wanted to make sure that at least for myself and our organization, I was inviting the best coach to the party that could actually help our folks get into the playbook the things that they need to do so they can be the very best at what they do and, and for our partners as well. So, um, so this is, uh, this is a great journey. We're going on again here today. Hey, so I mentioned earlier, um, it could feel a bit like a burden. This law kind of reminds us that maybe it is the law of sacrifice. Tell us about it. Well, the law of sacrifice just simply says you have to give up to go up. And, and we all have to. Uh, th there's no such thing as climbing a mountain with a lot of weight on. And, you know, if I'm just going to go climb a hill, I suppose I could carry a backpack with me and a few other things. But the higher the climb, the harder the climb. Two things are needed. You need a team to help you get there. And you need to give up things. You, gotta, you need less weight on you. And, uh, you know, I hear people all the time that say, well, you know what, when I started out, I gave up a lot. And I said, you didn't give up anything. When you started out, you had nothing. I mean, what, what, what did you give up? When I, when I started out, Pat, I got out of college. Margaret and I got married. I didn't have anything. I mean, I had a 1964 Falcon. And I mean, I, I you know, what, what am I going to give up? You know, I, 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 I you know, have more time than money and, and, and more time than experience. I, got, I mean, I didn't give up anything. But here's what happens. As we begin to be successful, we come to junctures in our journey where we have to make a decision. And, and the decision is almost always, am I willing to give up something that I do today so that I can get to another level? And, and, and the, we have to constantly make adjustments. And, and the higher we go, the bigger the give ups. The, the, the give ups don't get smaller and right? people again that that's a big miss and they think well you know i'll get to a place where i don't have to deal with all those issues no no you always deal with those issues they just become bigger as you become bigger and so what i've learned is this when we stop growing it's not because we lack capacity it's because we lack the willingness to sacrifice um, you know, Tyler Perry and I were having a conversation one day and the end of the conversation simply was, I looked at him, and I said, Tyler, what you're saying to me is when you can afford to quit, you can't afford to quit. And, and, and that's just, that, that's just the way it works. If you, if you want to quit, quit the first week, I mean, you, you didn't invest anything in it, you know, nobody will even miss you. But, but the more that you compound your life, the more you have to make these choice decisions. Uh, I call them trade-offs. And when I was, um, well, how old would I have been? I would have been, it, this would have been 1996, um, probably right before I met you, when I decided to make a major career change. I, I sat down and I, I, did a, I, I did some work, mental work on trade-offs worth making. And, and okay, if I'm going to leave this, well, I, I give this up. What am I going to? And it was out of the trade-offs worth making, teaching, and, and exercise I went through that I that I came to the conclusion: you never leave something; you go to something. If 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 you leave something, you keep turning behind to see what you left. So so one of the trade-offs you give up is you know the you know the greatest what the greatest detriment to our success is what Pat today's success. Well, why is that? Because when I get success, I want to hold on to it. Don't, I don't want to change. I don't want to adjust. Okay. That's what happens. But it limits. Yeah, it limits. I've always told our leaders that as your responsibilities and opportunities increase, um, freedoms oftentimes in life decrease. Increase. Because yeah. there's just more demand that people have for you and of you. And and you just have True. to see that not as a burden, but as a as what it really is, which is a blessing to be yeah. in other people's lives in a way where they actually see you as someone that can help them in their life, write their best story. Um, great stuff, John. So there's 21 laws. 
And I would never do anything other than tell everybody in the audience, every single one of them is absolutely critical. If you want to get to a level five, like John talks about the best of the best leading, but John, if, if you were just thinking about it, um, what, how do you think about the most important law? Like the one thing you got to get right to be able to even take on the rest of the laws. What is that? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm, smiling because it reminds me I was for two years after this book came out this book is in 56 languages they say in China alone it sold 10 million copies <coughs> that may be true I don't really know I know I probably got paid for a hundred thousand let's start there but anyway <laughs> that's, that's, that, that that's a, that, that's another story. But I, but so I'm doing I'm doing the 21 laws of leadership with the 20 law one laws of leadership 21 laws of leadership. And some kid comes up to me during a break when I'm doing the 21 laws of leadership, but he's just as intense as can be. And he leans and he said, "Okay, I got it. 21 laws, got it, got it, got it." He said, "Okay, what's the one thing I need to know to be a great leader?" And I looked at it, I, you know, and I, I decided to match his intensity. I leaned into it. I said, well, the one thing you need to know to be a great leader is that there's more than one thing you need to know to be a great leader. There's 21 <laughs> things. There's 21, 21 things that you need to know. That's why you think I wrote the 21 laws of leadership. All right. So, so thank you. For the answer to everyone, the most important law is the law number one. Go get the book and read all 21 <laughs> laws <laughs> oh, and then execute that. all 21. <laughs> well, and, and you know what happens is when you do that, you, the first thing is very humbling because the, we, when you do that, you realize that you, you don't do all 21 laws well. You know, I wrote the book and there are six laws of the 21 that I would consider myself average, hair above average maybe, but but not not like a if, if the scale is 10, I'm a five or a six, maybe a seven, and maybe, but there are half a dozen laws. I, I would not, not be much more than a six or a seven. And, and what, what's so beautiful about the 21 laws is then you begin to understand the need for teamwork. And, and so what you do is you begin to gather people around you that have skill sets in some of the laws that you're, yep. you follow. Like, like the law of navigation, I would be the weakest in. I know how to navigate, but it just bores the heck out of me. And I don't want to navigate. I, I, I you know, I, I see big picture, you know, I don't, you know, but I, I've got fantastic navigators around me that just are major every day carrying the details. And so it, it's important, but, but let me go back to your question now, just real quickly, the law of the lid, L-I-D, the law of the lid. The first law is the one that I put first because that's foundational. Everything, you know, everything rises and falls on leadership. How well you lead determines how well you succeed. And if you don't get that one, then you, know, you won't read the rest of the book. I mean, the, the, the reason I teach, have taught leadership for 50 years is because I truly believe that everything rises and falls on leadership, period, in the story. I, I, I believe that when a person learns to lead, they get better. They get better. I don't care what their business is. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. You get better, and the people get better. So you have this compounding. Everybody's getting better, but they're getting better because you've learned to lead. And, and when I say everything rises on leadership, when everything falls on leadership, um, the, the rising of leadership, successful leadership is dependent on two things, leadership skills and good values. And you can't substitute one for the other. I know people who have great leadership skills and have terrible values. So they manipulate people and they just take advantage of people all the time. I know some wonderful people who have no leadership skills, but they have great values. And what I tell people is you, if you've got somebody that has no leadership skills but great values, make them a friend, but don't, don't, don't get on their team. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not going to take you anywhere. They're not going to. You follow them, they're not going to really help you. So, so, but when you put both of them together, then all of a sudden, good things begin to happen. And, and, and so here's what I say. You train leaders with skills, but you transform leaders with values. And, and, so, and, and, and so I love to see a trained leader. It's a good skill set, great skill set. But it's also transformation. 
which is a person now that has embraced and lives out these values on a daily basis. When you can, when you can get a, a leader with both of those, that's good things. But when you talk about uncertainty, all things we're going through right now, you and I both know, Pat, that values, that's the great stabilizer for a time like this. Uh, when you know what your values are, decision-making is quite easy, even during very difficult time. And so, you know, I mean, I go back to COVID. I remember Mark Cole, who re really runs everything, all our companies. I remember him and I having a very uh, important discussion when COVID hit. And what are we going to do? And I said, oh, it's very simple. We're going to keep our values. Just we're, mm -hmm. that nothing changes. Nothing changes. COVID's changing everything, but it, COVID doesn't take my values away. Th those are my values. We're going to treat people well. We're going we're gonna to do everything we possibly can to keep people on the team but we're, we're not going to we're not going to let go of our values right now and, and again i think that's core even right now with the uncertainty and you know in the economic world that we're that we're in you just if you if you, listen they can take away a lot of stuff in your life but they can't take away your values and once you have that that that's solid you know empty bags don't stand up straight they fall over Mm -hmm. and, but, but once you have some good values on the inside of you, the 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 the, the, the winds of adversity blow, but, but you stay strong. You, you stay strong because you've already settled. And by the way, you settle your values before adversity. Uh, you know, you don't you don't wait till the winds blow. And say, oh my gosh, let me see here. Let me get some values here real quickly. It, you know, you, you get your values and, and 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 then you just let those values give you strength during this time. Well, you know what, John, back in the late 90s, <clears throat> of course, I was a lot younger then. Um, my whole team at my previous organization, we not only read the 21 laws, but we invested a six month period of our life installing them and practicing them every single day. And I know what it meant for me because it was like a playbook that we put into our yeah. organization and everyone yeah. was executing the plays and getting better at it. And ultimately that meant that the people that we were responsible for were actually getting a lot better ride with all of us. So if you've not, if you're in the audience today, you've not read the 21 laws, it's a great time because there is the anniversary version that just came out. There's one more um, law I'd like to address. I was on a meeting this morning with several of our peeps and one of them said to me, you know, we're all alpha dogs. And I, <laughs> that was the term. And you know, and the, the meaning was that we want to always be the best and we want to always compete to be the best. And we do have a standard here. And in fact, all the folks that are on this um, uh, meeting today, they, they all want to win victory, right? They all want victory because yeah. of the benefits that victory. Talk about the law of victory. Yeah. Yeah, I will. That uh, you, you asking me that question reminds me of Rick Hendrick is a wonderful friend of mine and he's in the automobile industry. Yes. I don't know, maybe 120, 130, um, you know, automobile stores across America. In fact, our, our company does leadership training for them, but he also has NASCAR. You know, he, he's, he, he's, a, he's the most successful NASCAR owner today in the world. And so he called me up one day and he said, John, he said, uh, yeah, I, I need you to come up and talk to our drivers and our pit crew, et cetera. And I said, well, tell me, what do you need? He said, well, he said, you know, they're all competitors. It goes right back to you. They, they all want to win. They're, I mean, when they get out there in that car, they've, they've worked all week to, to circle that, 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 that track quickly. He said, they all want to win. But he said, we're also all on the same team. I mean, it's, it's Hendrick team. I mean, but we got, we got four drivers out there you know driving like you know bats out of hell but 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 the same sense we're all on the same team and he said i'm trying to get my my drivers to be competitive and yet cooperate and i said i need to hang up on you right now that's I mean, <laughs> you, 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 you hendrick you just asked me to almost do the impossible how how, how do you take these alphas well males like you said and and, and you know and get them to cooperate so I worked hard on the lesson for him, and, and the essence of the lesson is when I went up and talked, had a, in fact, we had a delightful day with him, is it is it is not, it's not either or, it is both and, 
but there's a way to place both that that is compatible. And, and let me explain very simple. You you want your people to be competitive. You want your people want to win. Hey, I mean, honestly, which, how many people do you want on your team that really doesn't say, God, well, I don't care, win or lose. Oh my gosh, you know, easy come, easy go. I mean, we don't want, we don't. So you you want people who are competitive who want to win. You also want so you want them to be successful and you want to create a climate for them to be successful. But you also want them to understand that if they really want to be successful, they not only win, but they help the people around them win too. So I, I say, it depends, do you want to win once or do you want to win twice? It's, it's, it's that simple. If you want to be a single winner, be competitive, and, 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 but don't help others. But if you want to get the double win, be competitive, absolutely win as much as you possibly can, but always be serving, adding value, sharing secrets with, with you know, I, I sat down with the pit crew the other day, in that day, in that lecture, I said, look, if you find something that works for your car, guess what, it'll work for their car too. Now, why don't you just go ahead and share it and then see, now that you both have equal footing, who's the better of the two? <laughs> And by the way, and trust the fact that you'll come up with another idea about how you could get better because you had that idea, right? I love it. Oh, um, I oh, agree because I think I think when I run into the best people, no matter what industry, they are incredibly competitive and they want victory, but they also have this humility and generosity to where they want to bring other people with them and affect other people. And I think it's almost because they believe that they're going to continue to get better by doing so, which which I believe that. Hey, I went into uh, to a real estate office recently to speak, and I, I asked everybody in the office to raise their hand if they only wanted to do business with people that voted like they did or agreed on social media with their point of view. Uh, and no one raised their hand, of course. And then I asked them, well, are you on social media? espousing things that would keep half of, I don't know, the community from wanting to do business with you. Um, our good friend uh, who introduced us, Andy Stanley and I, we we had him on our program last month. You know, he's got a new book, Not In It To Win It. And I thought about it when I first saw the title, it's not, it's not natural to not be in it to win it. But of course, Andy, as he always is, is much deeper, more thoughtful. And as it got down to it, he was really just trying to make the point to Christians that we have to be, you know, we have to be in it to to do our job, to love on people. And when we divide, we don't get that done. And I think many ways, one of the questions we talked about earlier, how difficult it is in the workplace, people dragging all the division with them. We got to somehow or another give them a place to go with it. We put a, a creed that we created here at Supreme on our wall, and it says that I'm for everybody. I'm not for everything, but I'm still for everybody. And I think it's just one of those things that Andy was trying to get across uh, in his in his writing. He's an amazing dude. And he said to say hello. I told him I stood, John and I, I saw him this past week. He said, I said, John and I are going to be catching up. He said, well, tell John, I said hello when you get there. So I've just checked the box um, that Andy Stanley uh, said to say hello. And for those in the audience, you don't know this, but I started going to Andy's church in the late 90s. John and his team had financed with, uh, with Home Bank. And then uh, Andy called me one day and said, hey, I want you to meet this guy. And I said, who's that? And he said, John Maxwell. And I was like, okay. So I had the blessing <laughs> 25 years ago, about the time this book was about to come out, of having lunch uh, with John Maxwell and Andy Stanley, you talk about being blessed, um, not only that day, but every day since, because I've gotten to, to be in both of your lives. John, you're amazing. I want to keep you on because we've invited the audience to um, raise the flag, which would put them in Ty's room uh, back here to ask a question. So Ty, if you would take some questions for John, we would appreciate it. Um, I have a question for you. We, as leaders we always have leaders it's i kind of see it more as a cycle you're you're always serving other leaders and people that you look up to and so i was wondering you as a leader and pat as a leader the people that you look up to how do you best serve them so that you know hey i support you and i want to lift you up and how do you serve your leaders it's a great question shannon and the i've 
I've tried to do this for several years. And in fact, in 1995, I'd made a determination. I picked out 10 people that I wanted to serve. And I said, I, I, I'm going to um, do everything I can to add value to them. Then I asked myself your question, Shannon. Well, now how do I how do I do that? And, and so I you know thought about it a while, and it took a few months. And, and now this is kind of embarrassing because I, I I found out how to do it. And when I found out how to do it, I thought, oh, John, you could have been able to do that quicker. If I really want to add value or serve a leader, Shannon, like let's say I want to serve you, I would just go to you and say, Shannon, I'd like to add value to you. So tell me. What's the thing I could do for you the most that you think would add value to you? In other words, I asked them, and I was so I, I was so surprised, Shannon. John, I really you're a genius. John, you're a genius. I can't oh, I, believe I, it. I, I'm totally an idiot that's lived 75 years. That's what I've done. I mean, if you live long enough, Shannon, you're young. You're young. If you live long enough, you're you very figure, kind. Thank you. Yeah, hey, you figure all this out if you live long enough. But but yes, I because I think, well, how should I serve it? And I'm trying to get, you know, just how good. And one day I thought, well, why don't you ask them? And they'll and, and they told me. And so I all of a sudden I thought, well, that was sure easy, you know. So that's how literally that's how I would I would just say, love to serve you, add value to you. What can I do? And you hey, tell me. Shannon, this can work at home too. And for our audience, this can work at home because my my beautiful and awesome wife of 38 years, Lisa, is the leader of our household. And so I simply ask her if I was going to add value in your life, what would I do? And she's got a whole list for me. So it's great. Great question, John. Hey, Thanks. Pat, how are you? Hi, I'm John. How are you? Thank, you? thank you so much for your time today. Um, the question I had was this. As, as, as you're leading and as you're, as you're casting a vision, and you might run into people that um, share some challenges or or some disagreement with what you're saying. Um, how do you how do you lead them in the right direction? How much time do you give to to answering those challenges and and otherwise espousing your opinion in a stronger way? Yeah, well, yeah, that's a great question, Scott. And if you are leading any kind of a great vision, you will have people who uh, challenge you, or you will have people that don't don't catch the vision. So what I do is, is, again, very, very simple. Scott, if you were on my team and we were trying to, you know, go someplace and I felt maybe you were, you know, dragging or holding back, I just have a private conversation with you. And I, I would I would I would say to you, you know, Scott, I, I'm probably misreading the situation. But just from my very limited perspective, it seems to me like you haven't yet either caught the vision or bought into it. Is that is that true? And if it is true, could you tell me why? Because I would love to. I would love to learn from you because you you have a different perspective, surely, than mine. And how we view things is how we do things. And and, and I would I I would I privately, Scott, go to those people, and out of the private conversation, I come to the conclusion pretty much whether they're going to really stay with me or not stay with me. And and and, and I I don't I, I don't make like a change at that moment. But but it pretty I get a read at that moment, and so the only way I know to do it is is just to ask them the question. You know, have you bought into the vision? And and, and if you haven't, why haven't you? And, and and by the way, can you help me help you buy into the vision? And when you have that kind of private conversation, what you do very quick, first of all, eighty percent of the people that are not with you get with you when you have that conversation. That's number one. Number two is you very quickly find out the ones who aren't going to go with you. And that's okay too. You know, when I cast vision, I don't cast vision to unite people. I cast vision to discover people. There's a big mm -hmm. difference between those two. Uh, yeah, I find out, I find out who's going, who's the big player, who's not the big player. And so, but the private conversation will clear up almost every time. And then, then as a leader, Scott, you know what direction to take. Hope that helps you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Scott, great question. Great seeing you, my friend. You too. Thanks, Pat. Thanks for this. We'll take one more question. We have another question out there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Miss Jean Rawls. All right. John, I love listening to you today. I'm sorry I'm having trouble with my video, but you don't need to see me to hear the question, I think. Um, my question for you is, 
consistently throughout the years, and I think I first learned a view in the late 90s, your core values have always held strong. I want you to take us back to when you were a young boy. Tell me about what influenced you to carry on throughout your whole life to have values that continue to build in the manner that they have. Wow. Well, that's an incredible question. First of all, I had a distinct advantage in that if I grew up in a home of values. My father and my mother had great values. So it was a natural environment for me to see uh, leaders that had good values. Now, as a young leader, I didn't always keep my values. As a young leader, uh, there were times when I was so desperately wanted somebody to follow me that, that I would lay aside a value that I had and try to develop a, 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 a leadership relationship with them. And what I discovered <coughs> was that every time I did that, I lost two things. I lost authenticity uh, and credibility. And so I, I realized very quickly that, it, it, the, here's what helped me. I realized very quickly that not everybody would follow me. And then I realized very quickly, not everyone should follow me. And then I realized very quickly, I don't want everybody to follow me. And, and so therefore, as I made those decisions, the values became much more dear to me and I embraced them. And over time, what happens is great values over time prove themselves. I, I tell people all the time, if your good time is on your side, if your bad time is not on your side. And, 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 and when, you, when you have good values, um, even when things don't go well, which they don't in leadership, my gosh, I mean, really, are there two good consecutive days in any leader's life? I mean, we're dealing with issues and problems all the time. But when you have great values, at the end of the day, you don't look at the scoreboard, you look at the values. And if I've been true to who I am, and if I've been true to what I believe, and I've, and, and I've, you know, and I've done things right, it's been a good day. It's maybe been a bad day leadership wise, but it's been a very good day. And I would rather have a good day with a bad leadership day than a, a leadership day where I made some gains, but I really gave up some, some values. I, you know, that, so it, that, just keep that as it's, and the longer you have those values, the more you see that they're true and they work and the more that you embrace you become more certain as you get older here you become less certain about most things but the most important things you become more certain on so when that. i was 20 when i was 25 i was certain about 100 things that i'm certain about. i'm certain about five or six you follow me but the ones i'm certain in i'm more certain than i've ever been before because they've been tested they've been tried values would be by far one of those things I'm very certain of it, and, and you will be too. You're 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 doing it. Good, good luck. Good question she is too. Doing it. That's, hey. that's for sure, Gene. Um, you are doing it. So thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah, John. It's been amazing having you here today. To our um, the folks that joined us today, our next session will be on September 12th at uh, 2 p.m. We'll have Entergage, which is an organization that does surveys for the best places to work around the country. So to the extent that all of you as leaders are attempting to create an environment where turnover is real low and productivity is real high, which is not normal in America today, the great resignation. All of the data tells us harder than ever, as we've talked about today, to lead in this environment. But if you join us on September 12th, you'll get an awful lot of great information about how to be intentional about building a best place to work. And there's so many benefits that go along with that. And then. Uh, on August 25th at 3 p.m., Tim Tebow is gonna be joining us on our personal and professional best program. And, and as I was listening to John talk about leadership, um, you know, every leader goes through circumstantially seasons, storms, where things aren't always going well around them. But if you keep your, your values, it's like the rudder on a boat. You'll get through those seasons, you'll get through those storms, and you'll be even better on the other side. And when we talked about having Tim Bebo on, the production team here asked me, what's the angle 
with Tim and I said, he has failed more than most human beings I know, and it's never changed his values. And he winds up succeeding then more than almost every person I know. And then we'll have after Intergage in September, in November, we'll have John Maxwell, the leader of the band, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. John, John will be back uh, in Yo, November as we, as we close our uh, Supreme Leadership season in 2022. John, best of luck, feel good. Keep your health good so that we get to keep you as long as possible and keep pouring wisdom into us. God bless. God bless. Thank you, Frank.